Hello and welcome to the Matrixes with us today. Yes, the Shiva. And Jonathan, yes, if we look a little tired today, we were out and about a lot today. And surprisingly, we woke up at the same time after four hours. We were both still tired, but somehow extremely fit. And yes, we did a lot of time travel, reality travel, dimensional travel tonight. And that's why we're making a video about time today, about changes in time and reality, because it was so exciting. Unfortunately, the video is not about our experience, but about another exciting thing. Yes, you can already find some articles and videos on the topic on the internet, namely the so-called Mandela effect. Yes, why is it called the Mandela effect? He died in prison in 1990. Yes, so think about it. If you think back now and don't know that much about the Mandela effect, when did Nelson Mandela die? Think about it. Yes, and many also say, like Shiva, that he died in prison in 1990. People also say they saw the funeral on TV. Yes. Okay, not me, I was too. You didn't see it on TV. No, I don't think that was okay. And in any case, many say he definitely died in 1990, and I saw it on TV, the funeral service, and the whole array of people and whatnot. Yes, but if you look on the internet, Mandela died in 2013. Many people were very surprised and said that couldn't be the case. Nelson Mandela didn't die in 2013. He was in prison in 1990. What's interesting is that there really is a large group of people who say he died in 1990. A very large group, we're talking millions here, who have the same opinion, but there are also millions who say, no, no, he died in 2013. And that is a very interesting phenomenon. And after this phenomenon, the word Mandela effect was born, because that's not the only thing. But apparently the first public? Yes, that's when it was noticed. And then, of course, these few million people started and thought, yes, are there other events that are somehow remembered so differently? For example, there is the fairy tale of Snow White here. You know everyone, right? Behind the seven mountains with the seven dwarves, you know everyone. And there was this evil witch who was so beautiful, at least she thought she was beautiful, and always asked her mirror, which was enchanted. And what did she say, the famous saying, Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most beautiful in all the land? Correct. Incorrect. I also remember that she always said that mirror to mirror on one wall. But if you look at all the fairy tales now, they say something completely different. She says that the magic mirror on the wall is the most beautiful one in the whole country. And anyone you ask, you can also ask around your circle of friends. Most of them all remember mirrors on mirrors on a wall. Well, similar. Also in the film, Luke, I am your father. Surely, well, maybe not everyone, but definitely very, very, very many. And yes, in the movie, it says everyone knows Luke, I'm your father. But now, even if you look at the old recordings and videotapes, it just says, I am your father. Where is Luke? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I remember that too. Because Darth Vader said that. You always said that to your siblings when you were a child. Logically, I'm your father. Hello. Hello. <laughs> 
When I think of all the people who, I don't know, joked with helium in their lungs or laughing gas in their lungs with Luke, I'm your father. Luke, I am your father. So many people remember it and there are tens of millions who remember it that way. And probably even more so than Mandela himself. Yes, another phenomenon that somehow fits into this Mandela effect category is the game Monopoly. Many of you know that too. A replica of our world in a small format as a board game on the kitchen table. Monopoly. And there was always a figure who looked more like a man from the 19th century. Century. And he always had a monocle, I think they say. I believe. Always had a monocle like that. And they also advertised the game using this figure on the packaging. Yes, and if you look now, he doesn't have a monocle anymore. It's shit. <laughs> yes, well, that can't be right. I mean, I also remember that he had a mononcle. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. He had that. But the same phenomenon here too. Millions of people remember him. He had a monocle. It has always been like this. And then we researched on the internet and looked at all the game packaging that you could find on the internet as a photo. And he doesn't have a monocle on any of them. Where did the monocle go? He's gone. Where Luke is? We went through a list and he asked me, there are lists of these Mandela effects on the internet. And then he asked me, how do you remember that? How do you remember that? How do you remember that? And then he asked me about New Zealand. Yes, it's so northeast, a little higher up, pretty big. And we both wanted to emigrate to New Zealand at some point, long, long before we knew each other. So we looked into it intensively. Of course, also where New Zealand is and how big it is. And then he says, no, it's much, much smaller, much further south. I'm like, no, that can't be the case. Absolutely not. We opened Google Maps and looked at it because no one could believe that New Zealand was now just a tiny speck at the bottom, right? And not such a huge device at the top, right? Where did New Zealand go? I also remember. With Luke and the monocle. Because I always wanted to visit New Zealand because they have them in Lord of the Rings. Yes, shot on New Zealand and thought... I, oh, it's such a beautiful environment. I'd like to take a look at it, at least on a vacation or something. True, true, true. Yes, me too. And then I looked on the map. Where is New Zealand? I thought, oh my God, flying on a plane for 24 hours just to spend a few hours looking at the Lord of the Rings filming locations was too far for me. Yes. Too much effort. But I also remember New Zealand was definitely northeast of Australia. If you look at Google Maps or the world map, Nope. Completely different. More southeast, I would say. And it's smaller, too. Much smaller than back then. I find that surprising because we both remember the same thing, just like our Eric Denikin effect, where we both thought he was dead and then he was still alive. That was our personal Mandela effect. That was our personal Mandela effect, yes. Some of you probably already know the story. We were both independent of each other. And I don't think we even knew each other. No, no. And then at some point the conversation came up. Yes, I still remember Eric von Daniken. He died back then. When was that? That was so... It was 2015 or 16, around the time of filming, I think. I am not sure anymore. And then I read on the internet that Eric von Daniken is dead. Then I thought, oh, what a shame. He was actually a good man. He had a lot to offer and had good attitudes. <laughs> yes, and then I researched YouTube on the internet, and then I found a video of a reporter interviewing his surviving wife.
And I watched the video and the reporter also asked, yes, what are you doing now after Eric's death with his legacy, all his books, all his research, and so on. And then the woman explained, his wife, yes, of course, we will pass on the inheritance and we will let everything run as it is so that it can somehow be honored accordingly and so on and so forth. Yes, and yes, later I found out how Eric von Daninen was dead. He's not dead, he's still in good spirits. And he even posts diligently on Twitter. Yes, and as you may remember, we wanted to hold an online conference about global awakening. Then, of course, we chose speakers, and then you suggested Eric Daniken. I'm like, no, he's dead. And then we started talking about how we both thought he was dead, even though he's not dead. And then you said, well, he's not dead at all, even though you thought so at the time. Yes, that is our personal Arendtiken story. Yes, also a typical Mandela effect. What I find very surprising is that I saw the video on YouTube where his wife was interviewed about her husband's death. And I saw the video, I'm 100% sure. And then, of course, when I found out later that Eric von Daningen was still fit and cheerful, I thought that couldn't be the case. And then I searched for this video on YouTube. Yes, does she mean I found that? Nope, it's with Luke. Is with Luke, also with Luke. <laughs> yes, another Star Wars story. What color are C-3PO's legs? So I know they are gold, 100%. Yes. What color are they now, or a leg of it? Yes, I think one leg is silver now, right? Yes, why? Another effect that millions of Star Wars fans remember, no, it was all gold. Yes, of course. There was nothing with silver in the leg, no. Here, there, what about James Bond's braces girls, Jim Bond? <laughs> yes, also one of these phenomena. So many of you know James Bond films, and I think there are two or three James Bond films that Roger Moore was in. I actually really liked Roger Moore in the Bond role, even a bit better than Gene Connery. And there is the James Bond film Moonraker, where James Bond always had to deal with his opponent's hitman, the so-called Walker. It was somehow 35 meters tall. No, but he was over 2.10 meters or something, or 220 meters. It was huge. He also had huge hands, and his professional killer method was to bite someone to death because he had a huge steel bit in his mouth. And later, at the end of the film, the devil becomes a good guy at some point because he fell in love with such a little blonde. Somehow, I don't know, she was only 170 mellows at most. It was a funny couple. When the two fell in love, they both stood next to each other and grinned so much. And then the assistant showed his teeth, and then the girl showed her teeth too, because she was wearing braces. And that was the joke in the James Bond film. Everyone in the cinema laughed. All. Because somehow, that was the sign that the right couple had found each other. Kind of like that, yes, but if you look at the scene now, she's not wearing braces at all. Never been there. And I remember it very well because the whole cinema laughed. And I still remember the scene very well, but she doesn't have any cracked teeth at all. Never been there. If you look at the old films, there are no cracks in the teeth. Crazy. Hand on heart. Oh, where was that now? Yes, where is your heart? Well, I remember it being on the left. I can confirm that the heart was always on the left. Always left, but now it's no longer left. I do not know why. 
similar phenomenon with the kidneys. So the heart is supposedly here in the middle somewhere there, right? Yes, right in the middle. And we all remember it. Mom always said, put something around your kidneys or you'll catch a cold. Or other people put a kidney belt on and it just sits here on the hips, right? Because the kidneys were more down there back then, but now somehow they are no longer there. They're somehow nearby now, or maybe it's the lungs or something. Yes, the kidneys are now much higher, and the kidney belt is somehow still there. And that makes the kidney belt pretty pointless if it's on your hips. And with this strange update, someone somehow didn't calculate that the kidney belt is now actually a waist belt so that your stomach doesn't catch a cold. <laughs> I don't know it. How many people were in Kennedy's car? Oh, I don't know anymore. Not even, I wasn't there. So there were two drivers in the front. Kennedy and Jacqueline sat in the back. I think her name was Jacqueline, right? His wife. Yes, and yes. But I don't remember anything else now. Apparently there were six people in Kennedy's car. Six? Not four, it has changed. Oh, right. There used to be four people in the car, now there are six. Okay, yes, I only have four in mind, but I saw them maybe once or twice in some old video footage or something of the attack that was filmed. Yes. What was Hitler's eye color? Brown? I would say so too. Yes, but she isn't. No. Nope. How is she? Blue. Blue. But I also remember brown, so I definitely had brown on my mind always. But in any case, Hitler doesn't have brown eyes. But he was also Arik, right? Arik, Arik? Yes, very exciting. Where is Earth in the Milky Way? I remember the very outermost ring. That's what we were told. The Earth is at the bottom of the galaxy. Yes, I still know that too. On the far left, on the far outside, the last corner. Around 10 o'clock, completely outer ring. Yes, 10 to o'clock, exactly. Yes, and when someone asked me, where is the earth in our Milky Way, I always said that we are very far out in the country. And I know that I started reading astronomy books when I was five because it just fascinated me so much. And I've done that all my life, and I'm really damn sure earth was fucked up in the galaxy. Yes, and if you look today, it's not there anymore. No, she isn't yet. It's now further inside, so it's still more in the edge area, but in the second arm. And that wasn't the case before. Yes, who remembers the Looney Tunes? How were they written? I remember Looney. And how is Tunes spelled? T-U-U-N-E-S. But now it is written like iTunes. We are the champions, complete, complete. <laughs> yeah, so if you remember the song, We Are the Champions from the Queens, with Freddie Mercury on stage and live, and I don't know what, or on TV or on YouTube or whatever. Nobody watches TV anymore because of the mainstream media. They have ruined everything. If you look on YouTube and look at the old recordings, you'll hear, we are the champions. And at the end of the song, it was always of the world. Yes. Or? I remember it like that. Yes, that was actually always, we are the champions of the world. That was always kind of the end of the song. And everyone actually remembers it. Well, I don't know anyone who would have said otherwise. Yes. And if you look now, then... I did a special search the other day and I found a 15-year-old video. And? So it's from Queen and a live recording, but at the end he doesn't sing of the world. 
Yes, that's strange, isn't it? And it was 15 years old. Yes, funny. So these are phenomena where you think like this. How can that be? Millions remember it, tens of millions. Yes, and then there is Abraham Lincoln. You know, he was shot by an assassin in the theater. Yes, and of course the cameras back then were a little different than ours today. But you could take photos. There were a few options. And all these photos about Abraham Lincoln, who was president of America from 1861 to 1865. Always shown with a cylinder. Actually, almost always. That was his trademark. And when you thought about Abraham Lincoln, you always saw his top hat that he wore on his head. But if you look now, the cylinder is gone. It's also with Luke. He's with Luke too. Suddenly, almost all the photos, I think I found one photo where he was wearing a top hat, just one. But then it wouldn't be a trademark and everyone would remember it, so it's perfect. Correct, then it wouldn't be a trademark. Yes, you can also see at this point that the Mandela effect has struck here. Yes, what about psychology? Psychology says this is called fabulation. In plain English, yes, you remembered wrong, period. Millions, millions of dudes remember wrongly. Imagine a Star Wars fan goes to a psychologist. He has seen the Star Wars film 324 times. He watched it alone with friends, with his girlfriend, with his ex-girlfriend, with his parents, with everyone. And he remembers it 100% correctly when he says, Darth Vader said, Luke, I'm your father. And then a psychologist comes along who may have seen Star Wars once. And he says, no, you're remembering wrong. People. <laughs> and if it was just a Star Wars fan, that's okay. Then he's probably remembering it wrong. No problem. But there are millions. So I think all Star Wars fans remember this sentence like that. I've never had a single Star Wars fan or someone who watched Star Wars a lot claim that they didn't say, Luke, I'm your father, but just I'm your father. That just ruins everything in the scene. So we tend to think that psychology is once again pursuing its socially oriented plan and would like this phenomenon not to be examined in more detail if possible. And say, yes, false memory, check the box, put it in the file and get rid of it. Yes, but masses of false memories can. Just again. And there was, for example, someone who opened a website just on the subject of the Mandela effect, but not to list them all, as we have done now, but rather he created a test. And using this test, you could then tick what you really remember. And what came of it? 84%. Remember the old version which no longer exists in the present. From most points. That is very interesting. 84%. So the other 16% remember wrongly? They don't actually remember, do they? In truth, they don't remember because they can prove it. The 16% obviously have a big advantage. They have evidence and can say, here, look in the Star Wars films. He says, here, I'm your father. There's nothing with Luke. So 16% remember correctly and 84% remember incorrectly. How likely is that? Very unlikely. And based on that, we have, yes, our own view of what happened here. Well, who played at the time? Who stole our reality? Yeah. 
Yes, we assume that a timeline change has taken place, a collective timeline change. Was it initiated by someone now? For example, if you practice spiritual dissociation, such phenomena also appear. Personal. This means that as you practice dissociation, something suddenly changes in your reality. Certain people behave completely differently than usual, or you suddenly see a plant somewhere that has never been there before. Or you see something outside that you have never seen before, or that wasn't there before and is suddenly there. And such phenomena arise in spiritual dissociation, in the personal reality environment, I say now. And that is also possible collectively, if you can see. Yes, we already talked about it in the last video, about manipulating the perception of time. And of course, this is also initiated from outside. This didn't just happen. And suddenly we have a shortened perception of time. No, someone is tinkering with the devices to change our perception. And that's exactly what you can do with timelines or alternative realities. Yes, we're watching a series like that right now. Or did you just watch? That was pretty funny, right? Yes, somehow. What was that name? Before Rangers. The Foreigners. At least this series. Yes, it's a bit of a tongue twister for German people. The funny thing is it's a Norwegian series. Yes, but it's good. From Norway, you all know Norway is long and soft. But wonderful. But wonderful. And it's kind of a mix between the Dark and Viking series, right? Yes, right, exactly, you're right. Yes, if you liked the Dark series and enjoyed watching the Viking series, B. Fongers is a great choice. It's a bit, yes, very European in design, a bit German almost, in terms of style. But it's still pretty good and also deals with topics like alternative realities, time travel and so on. Things get exciting, especially in the second season. So highly recommended, very funny, even if it still contains the classic narratives that are currently being pushed. But if you look past that, then it's very good. Do you mean the song who turned the clock goes for free? The pink and red panther knew. At least the person who painted it or wrote the script. Is the pink and red panther even pink anymore? Anyway, maybe he has a similar background story to the Simpsons. Or maybe he doesn't have a tail anymore. No idea. Maybe he has something different now. Maybe a bushy tail, a tuft or no ears or a white muzzle or something. Yes, but can you think about it? Like Pikachu with the black tail, there was an argument about that too. Oh yes, that's right. He somehow has a different tail now. Yes, it's stupid when someone plays around with your tail. In any case, we don't believe in a coincidence or an accident that the timeline was suddenly changed somehow. That was either a huge collective agreement, which somehow doesn't make much sense with stories like that. Or someone actually turned the clock or played time. To the alternate realities, either to take a huge psychological test or to pursue their own plans. The Mandela effect or the effects that occur are just the side effects that happen when you change reality collectively. And we just came to the people, the 16% from our reality where there is no look. 
Correct. So that means we come from reality A and are now in reality B, where these same changes prevail. And something like that happens to you personally, more often than not every day. Yes, of course. Pay attention to it. If you're somehow surprised that a plant suddenly appears somewhere that you previously thought was there, even if everyone else then says, no, it's always been there, you can't rely on that. Even. Because if you change the timeline from reality A to reality B, where the plant is everyone in reality B, because that's where they are at home, we'll say that the plant has always been there. They're logically correct. Both are right. And he says, no, the plant was never there, it didn't exist. I still remember in the beginning we had this phenomenon a lot. Yes, of course. In the dissociation, the spiritual dissociation of our master technique, it is also the case that such phenomena are experienced. And that's why both are right. That is the point. If some people say, no, Luke, I'm your father, it was never said like that in that sentence, then they're right because they belong in reality where that's how it was. And then you come from reality where you say, no, he told Luke, I'm your father, quite clearly. And both are right. They were just in different realities and how often this happens all over the world with everyone personally. I think there are probably thousands of times in a lifetime where this happens. But the things are so small and... Insignificant, the ego is also there to set the filter so that you don't even notice this mini change in reality. He simply filters them out. It's like if you have, I don't know, a video with a hundred images or a hundred frames running really fast. And if there is a picture in between that is different and doesn't actually belong to this video, you wouldn't even notice it. Because it happens so quickly, the film that you think you have now. Or maybe you remember when you were a child, when you were a child. Then the mother said, Shiva, let's bring the salt. Mom, where is the salt? Yes, that's what's on the fridge. And then Shiva, Mom, there is no salt here. Each of you is probably familiar with this situation. Yes, you see, no salt. Look in the cupboard, kitchen cupboard, no salt. Then the mother arrives and says, man, you can't find anything either. And says, here's the salt. And you know, you looked at this point. Most certainly, and there was no salt. Yes, what does the ego say about this? Or the mother first replaces the child's ego until the child has its own ego and has installed its own camouflage. The mother, of course, says, yes, you don't have eyes in your head or you must have overlooked that. But you were sure, no, no, there was no salt there. And if there was no salt there, then there wasn't any. And that's what we're taught in our society, not to trust your perception. That is the basic statement that psychology also carries as a banner at the top. Don't trust your perception, because your perception can be wrong. You can see what resulted from that. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your higher self. That is the task of psychology. Just like farmer's job is, don't trust your body. Your body is so weak, it can't do any of this. You have to take this, 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 this in order for the body to function reasonably well. So you can see what's going on. And that's just the point. If the child says, Mom, the salt wasn't there before, then it wasn't there either. Because the child was not in the exact same reality as the mother. That means the mother first had to come and show the child, so to speak, the reality in which the salt is in the front kitchen cupboard.
And it's a bit like that in psychology too. That's how it's done. In psychology, psychologists also try to show you that no, what you perceived doesn't exist. Here, for example, if you see ghosts, see the dead or something like that, in psychology it is immediately a schizoid personality disorder. And yes, I know. We'll show you what's wrong with you. That's exactly how it is. What are the Mandela effect, do you know? Any that we haven't listed yet? What changes in reality have you perceived? Tell us what your idea is, why we all remember Luke and the others don't. Yes, we'll be really curious to see what kind of personal Mandela effects you have. I think the salt thing is a classic example that almost every child has experienced at some point because the child is not yet fully adjusted to reality. It just wobbles back and forth a little while it's still so young and small. And in any case, I would be interested in that too. Yes, anyway, it was a funny video and it was fun and we'll see you next Sunday. Hopefully. Ciao. Take care. Thanks for watching.